Uh, my name is Michael Schäfermeier. Um, name gives it away, the accent might too. I'm from Germany, uh, Münster, Germany to be exact. Um, I'm currently head of business development at Zweitag GmbH, which is also a very German name. Um, and I'm also there to talk about technical things at the company. Um, formerly, uh, I started the uh, Elixir career basically at Bleacher Report, um, where I was fortunate enough to be um, spearheading some projects in uh, Elixir because it was a pretty good answer at the time for some of the technical challenges that we faced. Um, and then I got lucky again because uh, one of the Bleacher Report co-founders asked me whether I wanted to be part of a new company that we started together, and that was Inverse.com. And not surprisingly, I said yes. I think um, being, uh, having the opportunity to being part of something uh, from the very start and having a big say in how we want to do things is an opportunity that you can't really pass up on. Um, and that's uh, what I've done for the last three years. I'm also going to try to relax my arms. I'm, I'm a bit uh, nervous, so I'm going to be doing this a lot. Um, so I've, I've been with Inverse for three years, um, and we used Elixir there for everything that didn't need to run in the browser. I'm still waiting for the time where I can take that over as well with Elixir, and it looks like with Phoenix Live View, uh, we have an alley into that. But um, yeah, we, have, we had a bunch of different services. I'm going to talk about them in a bit, little bit too. Um, and they were basically all in Elixir, and the basically is also something I want to touch on. Um, I, I'm also a father, and that is uh, what changed my career path a little bit, because I was working for San Franciscan companies out of Münster, Germany, uh, which worked really well at the time, but as, as soon as my son was there, I kind of wanted to be back in Germany full-time and not having to travel uh, on a frequent basis. So last year, I um, helped friends um, with their company builder, Lab25, uh, where I was fortunate enough to be able to pop start some companies with them as basically an interim CTO. And uh, then since the beginning of this year, like I said, I'm back at Zweitag, we have uh, ventures there as well, and we're also using Elixir for customer projects. Zweitag is more of an agency uh, doing customer projects, but we also, like I said, help startups. So that's, oh, I also like to dive. I, I figured I'd put one not professional note on this slide. Uh, I I'm, I'm really like to scuba dive, so with a tank on my back in the water. Cool. Um, yeah, let's start with Red. Let's start with the drawbacks of using Elixir for startups. And uh, there are a few, and one of them is um, authentication. Um, it's, uh, if you follow discussion around Elixir and Phoenix on the Elixir forum, uh, this is probably not the first time you'll hear this. Um, there are authentication libraries out there. Let me start with us, with, with that. And they are really, really good for the purposes that they were built for. Unfortunately, those purposes, uh, a lot of times in a lot of companies, or in a few of the companies that I was able to be part of from the get-go, uh, those priorities didn't really align with what we were trying to do with authentication for those um, companies. Um, one, of re one of the reasons is, um, that the probably, I don't have stats, but probably the most um, beloved authentication library, Guardian, which is really good, is built on JWT. And JWT is great when you want to authenticate against different services, um, especially if those services don't have access to your main database or when they uh, are not, if, it, if, you, if you don't want to have these services talk to like a central authentication service. Uh, JWT is great for that because it allows you to verify that a user is logged in and that he is who he wants to be everywhere without having, like I said, access to the main data store. Um, it's not so great if you want to have sessions that can be revoked. Um, JWT in and it itself doesn't have a concept of revoking tokens, so you normally give it an expiration time, and after, say, a day or two or an hour, whatever you specify, the joke token is no longer valid and you need to obtain a new one. Um, that's, that didn't really fit too well with what we were trying to do, where we wanted to have a user be able to just lock out and then be locked out, not 
anybody else being able to use his session again. And Guardian allows you to do that with Guardian DB, uh, where they track which tokens were issued, and then um, if a token was revoked, they store that in the database, but that kind of defeats the purpose of JWT to start with. And they are very vocal about that, so this is not something that they hide. If you go to the Guardian DB uh, GitHub page, they are very open about JWTs are not really being there to um, expire sessions. Um, and uh, coherence is kind of the same. They don't use JWTs. They have sessions, uh, if you use Rememberable on coherence. Um, but it's their own data structure around sessions. And uh, what I really needed were sessions that stored more information than just I'm a session. Uh, I needed browser, lock in time, uh, current location, but also potentially things like what version of an app uh, was using that sessions. Um, and that's, that's more than just authentication. You, you start storing more information on a session than just that. Um, and that's where those authentication libraries, at least in my experience, and again, I ask everyone to raise their hand and dispute with me, uh, have, a, have a dispute with me, uh, but at least in my experience, those authentication libraries didn't work really well for that, which is a very specific purpose that I was trying to use them for that didn't work too well. Um, I hope I said authentication, because now I'm talking about authorization, and I always mix these two up, that's why I used us star to just um, the second part is authorization and there's not really like a go-to way at least not one that I found to specify what a user can do in your system in Phoenix um, I ended up using contexts for that a lot so that within a context when you wanted to say list projects that you worked on it checked what user was locked in and then figured out what projects that user had access to but it was always a very like self-rolled way of handling the connection between uh, persons, users, whatever, and the resources that they should have access on and what kind of access they should have on. Um, and I've also worked a lot with Ruby on Rails, so a lot of the comparison that I'll draw will be with Ruby on Rails. I'm sorry about that. Um, and in Ruby, we have Pundit, which just gives you a nice wrapper around uh, specifying, or it just gives you a nice way of specifying what a specific user can do. And you can do that on a per user basis, and you can do that on a group basis and stuff like that. And again, authorization is kind of there in Guardian. You can add permissions to user, which then will get to added to the JWT, and you can write what he can, what he cannot do, but it's, it's just information, so there's no link there with your source code and your um, models. Um, we also experimented with third-party authentication services. Um, there's AWS Cognito, there's Google Firebase, and I just realized that I don't have my moderator's notes on here, but I'll, I'll just swing it. Um, and there's Auth0, um, and they abstract all of that away from you, and authentication will be a pain to manage yourself, so that's an option, but I didn't find it to be a great one because you're giving a very crucial part of your application away and um, you're trusting somebody else to keep your user data safe and that always kind of felt a little bit weird to me. Um, but it's an option um, and I'll motivate why all of these things are important for startups in a little bit. Admin backups. I was afraid that I didn't have enough content, but now I look at the time, I see I'll have to speed this up a little bit. Admin backends uh, are another thing. There are admin backups, uh, backends in uh, Elixir for Phoenix. Uh, there's xadmin and I uh, forgot the second one. Or something. Um, and Xadmin looks pretty good, um, but there's still things that we weren't really able to do that we would have been able to do with, say, Active Admin or in Python with Django, you actually have admin backups built in. And I think that's fairly crucial because um, building admin backends, they don't have to be pretty. Um, so that's different from the rest of your application. If really just your own company is using them, they can be as shitty as they want to be. Um, and that's the fact if you're using the Django admin, it looks horrible, but it works and it's there. And that's a big plus if you're starting a company not having to build your own admin backends. Um, so uh, that's something that, I, and with xAdmin, um, they have a DSL to describe 
um, what you want to administer and how, um, but we didn't, it wasn't flexible enough for us. Um, so we always ended up or with, with two companies that I started. We ended up rolling our own admin backends. And sometimes we had Google spreadsheets as admin backends, which is horrible, but it was the fastest way of getting there. And that's something that you might want to consider when building a startup. Uh, another thing that used to be uh, a big issue for us was monitoring. Um, so even when you get started, it might be a good idea to see what's going on. Especially when you get started, you have the unique opportunity to measure exactly how your app performs on probably low load. And that's, uh, so you want to have as much insight as possible to know what, what you'll have to change and optimize. Um, and that was a very involved process in the past. Um, I actually wrote a Medium post that kind of took off uh, after my last conference talk on measuring Phoenix applications with Exometer. And that works really well. Uh, Exometer is a great library, but it's also super involved. Um, and you, ha you have to kind of understand how Exometer works before you can really put it into production. Or you can copy and paste the code that I wrote in the Medium post, but it's not really what you're trying to achieve for that. Um, and then you still have to figure out, OK, now that you collected the metrics, what, are you, what do you want to do with them? Do you want to export them to StatsD and just use a service to display them? Do you want to ship them somewhere else? Um, again, I, I encourage you, I will have a Q&A at the end, but I encourage you to say, this is bullshit, it's easy to measure, and this is how we've done it. I, I'd be happy about that. Um, I think it was Pinterest, that did Elixir meter, uh, which was like an Elixir wrapper around Exometer. Uh, we've played around with that a little bit, but it didn't really work for us. Um, they had a, a master branch that wasn't really usable, and then I had to use a different checkout, um, and it looks like a development on that has also stopped more than a year ago. So nothing really that, that uh, eased the pain there. Um, things have started to change considerably in the past. Uh, there's telemetry now, which looks really, really, really pro promising um, because it's starting to get baked into more and more libraries and kind of start to become a standard features of library that they tell you about like what they are doing and how long it takes them, which is absolutely great. Um, but it's also like work in progress right now. Not all libraries will have it yet. And um, there are GitHub projects that help you export telemetry data to wherever you want to have it. Um, but there are also, I didn't find too many great tutorials that are just plug and play. And um, ideally, if you start a company, you, you'll be in, for all, I mean, obviously, I'm making some uh, generalizing assumptions here, but um, normally you'll be very, very resource constrained. So you can ignore monitoring, which is something I wouldn't recommend, or you can invest resources in them, but then you'll want to make sure that it's the least possible resources and still get you there. So I think telemetry might enable you to do that in the future, um, but right now it's still kind of not there yet. All right, last thing. Um, that's not really anyone's fault, um, except maybe ours, because we didn't spread the love enough. Um, but one thing that definitely um, you will notice when you start companies with Elixir is that the adoption is just not at the same level as some of the other languages that are usual go-tos for startups. So. Um, if you go to AWS or other service providers, as, as, uh, other SaaS uh, solutions, they will most likely have ready-to-build libraries for you. Um, and in Elixir, there's great, especially for AWS, there's a great third-party library, XAWS, with all of the sub-packages, sub and that works really well. So AWS is not the prime example here, but um, it's just indicative of uh, software as a service companies or platform as a service companies are not having a standardized libraries that they run themselves just because Elixir's adoption is just not as, as big as, say, Ruby or Go's. Um, and it also means that it, you'll be extremely hard pressed to find experienced engineers that are that intimate with Elixir. Um, that's just something to keep in mind. I'll address that in a bit. Uh, when, we, when I stop bitching about Elixir and when I start telling you what's great about it. Um, but 
just because adoption isn't there, there's just not a huge market of Elixir engineers that are really good that are looking for a job. Not that that is the case in other programming languages. So uh, you have a huge pool of Ruby engineers, but the good ones are also hard to find or have a very well-paying job. Um, but yeah, with, with Elixir, just the pool of people that you uh, can potentially hire is, is just a lot smaller. All right. Enough about what didn't work well. The um, reason I start with that is it's a, it's a good rhetorical figure if you want to have something positive that you start with the bad and you end with the good. So that's what I'm doing here. Um, and that's where we get to right now. Because there are benefits of using Elixir. And I want to kind of expand on them a little bit. Uh, one, it's, one is that I've learned today to, only to a certain extent and not fully pure, but I always considered it to be a functional programming language. And uh, that just has some huge impact on startups. Um, first of all, and again, this is, this is all very subjective findings, right? Like your, your mileage might vary, but I found that the Elixir code that was written in companies uh, that I started with or that I was as part of in the, at the early stage had a pretty good code quality, even though you might have junior engineers in there, just because uh, there's features in the language that kind of pushes you to writing maintainable applications. Uh, pattern matching is one of those things that just, um, if, you, if you really insist on people using it a lot, they most likely end up writing better code. Um, and it just makes uh, code way more readable. Um, you don't really have like return statements that you can hide somewhere in the function body and you have to figure out why that function is returning something other than what you expect on the last line. And uh, the strict division of data and logic is something that really, I think, works well in writing maintainable systems because you know that where your data lives is not where your uh, logic lives and the other way around. Um, I find Elixir and even Phoenix, and we can argue about that in a little bit, but I find Phoenix fairly explicit, um, especially compared to other languages and other frameworks. Um, so as, a, as an engineer, you, if you look at a controller function, so for example, there are two arguments that get passed into that function. That's all you can use in that function. Um, and you don't have parameters or uh, so get or post parameters or other information just appearing out of nowhere in your function body. And that's just functional programming versus object orientation. And I don't want to say that object orientation is bad. Um, but just for startups where you have maybe like a, a, um, a mixed group of people that will be working on your application, um, just having that level of explicitness makes it easier to understand, especially for people coming into your project, what's going on. Um, and yeah, functional programming has no side effects. I think that's a bit bold, but um, there, there's less side effects and not as many side effects as you would have in other languages. Uh, documentation is a big plus, especially for startups, because you'll most likely not have a big pool of knowledge in your company. Like you'll, you'll want to start bootstrapped, just bootstrapped and with not that many engineers. So being able to tap into the knowledge of other engineers or, or just being able to read good documentation is, is very, very crucial. And I've, I haven't looked at every programming language there is, but especially as I go back to other programming languages, I'm always amazed by how accustomed I got to really, really good documentation. So um, all of the core packages, but also nearly all of the third-party libraries that we worked with were really, really well documented. And not only giving you like the most important information, but also suggesting how you should be using it and, and what pitfalls there are. Um, Especially if you look at Ecto's documentation, for example, there are a lot of things in there that are actually educational. They, know, they don't just tell you you can embed data into this struct, but they also tell you when to embed and when to use associations and how to attach associations to data while you're creating it. And there's a lot of things that just read like a good book on programming rather than just documentation. And that's crucial if you don't have all of that experience in-house. And uh, it doesn't hurt that the documentation looks really, really good. I mean, it's not something that makes your life easier, but it just makes your life nicer, I guess. I I'm trying to figure out how to say this without 
hurting anyone. But in projects in the past that I've worked on, uh, I found that testing was perceived as something that you just had to do. And I've worked on projects where you develop the feature and then people were like, oh shit, we also need tests and then trying to figure out how to write tests. And if you don't design, especially in object orientation, your, your software code around testing, it will be pretty hard to test, uh, especially with edge cases. Um, I found that within Elixir projects, it didn't feel like like such a burden to test and um, in the beginning you want to move fast and all of these things uh, which is which is something you really want to do but also if you don't have tests you don't really have an opportunity to change things later and that will really come back to haunt you in startups so writing tests early is great um, elixir giving you a really good way of writing tests is even better and I'm not saying that this is not possible with other programming languages. I'm just saying we found it to be easier and, and not as much, as much of a burden on engineers as it was in other programming languages to test. Uh, community. Uh, a lot of these points I already touched on in my last talk, and I think these are very like prototypical Elixir points. I'm sorry for repeating them, but they just made a huge difference for the companies that I started. So I just wanna, wanted to highlight them. And community is one of them. I've uh, never worked in a programming community that was so inclusive and so open-minded. And even the most senior engineers or even the most senior contributors to any project, um, you can just approach in channels and ask them the stupidest questions and they'll be nice and respectful. Um, and that's not something that I don't think that's, that's usual for uh, big programming languages. Um, they are also super accessible. So if you go into the right Slack channels, you'll most likely, or, or ICQ or whatever works for you, you'll most likely find the author of the library and he'll be there and he'll be helpful. And that's huge, again, if you don't have a bunch of in-house knowledge and if you don't have 50, 60 colleagues that you can find the right one to ask that specific question. Uh, just having that pool of knowledge and that pool of experiences uh, at your disposal and just everybody being welcome makes a huge difference. Um, and for uh, more junior engineers, um, I always kind of to push them to take the next steps and contribute themselves. Even if we were in a startup context, I felt it was uh, crucial to uh, encourage them to contribute to open source just so they understand what it means and, and get better at it. And um, this community allows you to make failures and publish stupid packages without being chastised for it. And I think um, that is key for developing uh, more junior engineers. Uh, recruiting. Um, I said earlier that the pool of resources or the pool of uh, talent uh, that you can tap into is limited, and that's true, but um, you have something to offer that uh, other startups might not. Um, so at the end of the day, if, you, if you're looking for a job and um, you're not passionate about, uh, you, you don't get people passionate about what your startup does, you have um, equity, you have the salary, and you have basically like the, the whole package of what you're working on and with whom you work on it. And um, trying to beat the rest of San Francisco with equity and money is a very hard task and it will drain your resources quickly. So having something that people are really excited about and, and giving you an up in, in uh, negotiations is, is key to recruiting talent. And we felt uh, that Elixir was that because you allow people to work on something new most of the time. Like a lot of people we hired didn't have any prior Elixir experience. Uh, nearly all of them and nearly all of the ones that we spoke to really wanted to dab into Elixir. So just having that as something that you can throw into uh, negotiations was, was huge for us. And um, if you're recruiting more junior talent, which we've done a lot and I really always enjoyed teaching, um, is that Elixir, I found Elixir to be a great language to teach um, because it's pretty easy to look at, it's pretty explicit, um, and you don't need to understand as many things to be able to contribute your first line of code as you might have to in other languages. Um, I've already talked about the explicitness in, in and around like 
a controller function, so for example. But it's for junior engineers, it seems to be ver fairly clear where data is coming from and what they have to do to return it. And that's not true for, or that's not necessarily true for other languages. And you can basically like employ a step-by-step -step approach with them and just give them a bigger view of the world as they go along. But even the like most narrowest view that you can start with already gives them enough information to be productive and to have first feelings of success and feelings of contribution, which is huge for junior engineers to get started. Um, and as, as strong and as important as OTP is, and it's something that I haven't even touched on, um, it's not, you don't have to necessarily understand concurrency and OTP and all of the facets if you want to start building something or contributing something to Elixir project. Um, it does a pretty good way of abstracting these things away until you need them and then they're there at your disposal. And I think that's uh, something that really makes it easier for, for junior engineers to learn. Um, last good thing that I want to talk about, um, and there's, that list can be continued infinitively, uh, of course, but um, I kind of try to highlight the points that we really felt moved the needle the most. And one of the things uh, is operations. Uh, I think we have two more talks today about like Kubernetes and Docker, so I'm not going to go into too much detail there, but just being able to package, use a multi-stage build in uh, Docker and uh, use releases and put everything into a container that is self-contained and just has like a release and a binary that it can execute was huge for operations. Um, same as with everything else, uh, operations in a startup you want to keep as easy as as simple as possible. Um, infrastructure can be the biggest time hog. Um, I've had multiple instances where I uh, thought I would just do this one small thing in operations and two weeks later I still wasn't finished. Um, so whatever you can do to simplify that um, will help you. Uh, greatly. And I feel like releases in Docker are just a match made in heaven and they work really well and that's why I'm so excited about Elixir 1.9 because they make releases part of the language and as great as Distillery was, I think moving that functionality closer to the core of the language will be huge for operations. Um, recently talked to a good friend of mine who's, who's still running a startup and he claimed, and I have no data to back that up, but it works really well in this presentation, so I just use it. He claimed that with Elixir, he's able to run a really high traffic website on a grant a month rather than three to five, which other um, languages might have taken. Um, and at Inverse, we once wondered why we had so much traffic on one of the instances. Everything was going fine. Response times were good, and like everything was up, but we were wondering where all that traffic came from, and we realized that we have misconfigured our CDN to not cache anything. Um, and I've had that same experiences, uh, that same experience in another language, uh, in another company, and it took down our entire stack for a day, because we had needed to like untangle all of the services that it brought down with it, um, and build it back up. And that was like kind of like a well, we really, really missed out big time and Elixir saved our day kind of kind of situation. And I, I mean, um, it's, it just shows, I, I specifically didn't talk about like the normal talking points when you talk about concurrency and fault tolerance and how well it scales. It does and all that is true. But for startups, there are, I felt like there were more important things to talk about um, that move the needle for you. Um, so some learnings, some recommendations, um, most of which I've already touched on. Um, and this is basically like if, if everything else I talked about today wasn't interesting for you, um, mostly probably wasn't new, but I just wanted to reiterate them. This is probably like the most central slide in this slide deck is just make it simple. And that seems like a pretty obvious recommendation. And it turns out that it oftentimes isn't as obvious as you think it is. Um, I, I was reasonable, uh, I, was, I was the reason uh, for projects not being as simple as they could have been, because I wanted to do things right, and that makes sense, but there's also like a certain level of wrongness that you have to expect, uh, accept in a startup just to, to move the needle. Um, use frameworks. Um, Again, not, not a shocking uh, recommendation, I don't think. Um, but we um, experimented around rolling our own solutions because we felt like they were a better fit for a problem. And a lot of, time it worked, a lot of times it worked well, but the, 
the recommendation I would give here is like use a recommendation for as long uh, use, use a recommendation use a framework for as long as you possibly can, and only if you're convinced that it doesn't work, uh, go roll your own solution because normally uh, and research your frameworks use the one that you like best. Um, but normally frameworks do a lot of things that you're not aware of when you start re-implementing them and then along the re-implementation re route you realize um, how bad it was. Um, the next point is kind of like, I kind of like went both ways in the past. Um, we did a lot of server-side rendering at Beach Report when I first started, and it, it caused a lot of problems. And I think it's not a realization that was exclusive to BR. Um, so when we started Inverse, uh, basically everyone was uh, separating front-end and back-end and just doing a spa that would talk through REST or something uh, with an API, or at least that was our impression. So um, being the cool kids, we wanted to do the same. And it, uh, w with the experiences that we made last year, it makes a lot of sense to render as much on the server and just have uh, the, the presentation logic where your business logic is. If, uh, and obviously, again, I made generalizing assumptions. Uh, if, you, if your product is something that is living in JavaScript or that is, for example, showing things on a map that you can interact with, you, you won't be able to use so much server-side rendering and that's totally fine. And at that point, use React, use Vue, use whatever front-end library you like best or roll your own and be happy with it. But if you're a startup or if the project that you're working on is like 95% of the other projects out there where you basically have some cool logic around having a form and showing whatever you store, and if you look at different websites, different startups, like just storing data, retrieving them and presenting them in some way or another is 95% of what you will be doing. Uh, Server-side rendering might be a very, very good idea. And we can chat about that in a minute, but uh, Phoenix Live, you might also be a good idea just to reduce front-end complexity. And the last uh, recommendation I would have, would have, wouldn't have made uh, four years ago, but if you start something and there's not a good reason not to do it, do build a monolith. Um, you'll probably have a small team and you'll probably not have too much interference with people working on different things. Uh, once you do, uh, do break that monolith apart. Uh, but that's normally an issue that you'll get later on in your life. And um, starting with a service-oriented architecture uh, will introduce a lot of um, things that you don't really want to have to deal with when you just start with a product. Again. Uh, simplifying assumptions if you have something and it doesn't mean don't use services but what, I rec what I'm recommending is kind of have like your central app in the middle and try to ha do as much as you can in there and then if you ha need to have specified services uh, use them sparingly and cautious um, other than that just put everything in there um, I kind of wanted to use that um, given uh, the recent events um, and, and it really, really resonated with me when I uh, thought about this talk and when I wrote it because I think this is a quote, obviously this, this works in almost every situation, but I think this is a quote that uh, really um, exemplifies uh, what I was trying to convey, um, which is with Elixir, you, you're able to just make it work uh, in the beginning, and uh, then you make it beautiful. And normally, you really don't have to take the third step and make it fast. Like if it if it's if it's working and if it's beautiful, it's normally already fast. So that's time that you save later on. But also the make it work step. Um, Elixir being a functional language, or mostly functional language, allows you to just make mistakes early on, early on that, are, that are easier to cor uh, correct later down the road. So for example, if you put too much logic into one module, breaking out a few functions into their own module, or even their own package, or even down the line their own service, that's totally fine. Um, the, you will make, you will take shortcuts uh, in the beginning, but these shortcuts will most likely not be as expensive as they might be in other languages because there's not as much dependency between functions in a module as there is, for example, if you have functions in an object that depend on object internal attributes and then you have to like pass them down if you want to break out that function into another object or into a service, service object. And there's just 
lot more going on that makes it harder to like correct your mistakes or, or uh, work with the simplifying assumptions that you made in the beginning. Um, and then Elixir with, with functions and modules. I, I just felt like in the experiences that we made, it's, it's not as costly to make, to take shortcuts and to make mistakes. Um, so that's why this, this quote by Joe really uh, resonated with me when I made this uh, presentation. I decided to include it. Um, I'm already like approaching the summarizing part of the presentation. I think uh, it'd be great if we could have like a short discussion about what I just said after this. Uh, Elixir allows you to scale. It allows you to scale your team um, because you can break out functionality and um, don't have to do that from the get-go. Um, thus, it allows you to scale your code base and also allows you to scale infrastructure-wise because you can just throw more, serv throw more service at a problem, uh, even interconnect these services if you have to, and just uh, it works really, really well for scaling. Uh, we haven't made the experience that investors mind Elixir, so that was like kind of a um, worry that we had with Inverse, that we would find like institutional investors, VCs, and they'd say, what technology are you using? No, we're not going to invest in that. Um, that's not an that's not experience that we've made. Um, you might have to sell it a little bit, um, but mentioning that Elixir runs on a uh, virtual machine that is older than I am normally worked really well, um, or at least like whose foundations are older than I am. Um, and I think it's getting easier and easier too because there are like success, success stories with startups that used it um, that are a good um, reasoning, a good way of reason why you should be using Elixir. Um, and especially with, with um, Erlang being the foundation of everything and Erlang just being proven for uh, applications that are very similar to running a website uh, really helped us convince investors that we made the right technology choice, which is something that they, if they are good, will take into account when uh, judging whether they wanted to invest in you. And th this is always the final recommendation that I have. I'm not unbiased. I've been working with Elixir and I've started companies in Elixir for the last five years. So even though I try to highlight both sides of the coin, and even though I try to be objective, I will most likely not be. I wouldn't say always use Elixir no matter what you're doing, <laughs> what team you have. If you're experienced in a langu another language, uh, use that language. Um, if you do hardcore video processing, um, it might be a good idea to use some of the C libraries out there, and Elixir might not be the right choice. If none of these things apply and you have the chance to use Elixir, it's it's a great choice, and we've been really, really happy with how it helped us build companies. But that's not saying that you should use it wherever, whenever. Why would anyone uh, want to build a startup with Elixir, taking into account all of its drawbacks? Uh, isn't it an easier choice to choose some well-established technology, like, for instance, Scala? I don't know. Uh, you have to. I mean, you have to be really uh, excited about technology to experiment. Um, uh, with um, uh, Elixir Erlang uh, and taking into account all the restricted resources and uh, wouldn't it uh, increase risks uh, when you invest uh, in a technology like um, uh, which has some drawbacks? Um, isn't it a better choice to choose something else? Um, yeah, it might be. Um, but uh, the, the risks that you were talking about, I mean, every... every um, uh, decision that you're going to be making will introduce risks. Um, and using Elixir to build your startup will introduce risks, uh, risks as well. Um, what I was trying to, to show is that these risks are very manageable and that you, um, that for us, Elixir wasn't the make or break for the startup. Um, yes, in other languages, you'll have more sophisticated authentication libraries and maybe better telemetry baked in. Um, but the flexibility that Elixir gives you in going back and correcting mistakes and just making these mix mistakes in the get-go kind of offset those drawbacks for me. Uh, as for the resource pool, I don't know if I've, I'll find more people being excited about Scala than about Elixir these days, but that's also just my filter bubble. Um, but uh, finding talent was never really an issue for us, despite the smaller resource pool, because people were the people that I talked to, at least that we ended up hiring, were excited about trying Elixir. 
I mean, specialists, uh, from my understanding, specialists are uh, SCOS uh, in the, on that platform. Um, so sometimes it's uh, easier to find specialists. Uh, there is plenty of specialists uh, in other languages. So if you need to quickly uh, scale your company and you need uh, some personal, uh, some uh, staff urgently, uh, you just can't scale because of um, this uh, scarce of uh, specialists. You cannot uh, employ them in an instant. That, I mean, that's true. Um, if you have the money to spend and you just want to have 70 people, of which 20 are very senior, um, it might be easier to do that in a different language. Um, that's the simplifying assumptions that I was talking about. If you start lean and you have a small team, one specialist might be enough to the, for the get-go. And ideally, um, I, I mean, if you don't have a specialist in Elixir, I wouldn't start my company in Elixir. But as soon as you have one, it's easy enough to build your own. Um, and then if you take a normal scaling path where you add more and more people gradually and not 50 at once, um, we found that that is very manageable in Elixir. Obviously, th that's why I left the slide up. If you, for example, do ML or something like that, Python might be a better choice because there's just more libraries and more experts in data sciences that are used to like Python. Um, but that's, that's why I'm saying you, you kind of have to like look at what you're doing. Um, if, if you have the liberty to choose Elixir, I think it's a great choice. Uh, what's your opinion on uh, leaning to established but external solutions like Redis versus trying to use what Elixir has to get there? I mean, I, I'd argue with that a little bit. Uh, you can do background tasks in almost every language. It's just going to be a lot harder to set up and manage. Uh, so Ruby has delayed jobs, delayed job a sidekick, um, which will do a lot of the things that you'd otherwise be doing in a gen server in Elixir. I think the thing that is great in Elixir is that it just allows you to do everything in one node if you really wanted to get started. Um, and also the more services like Redis that you add to your stack, um, the more harder it will become to manage that stack and the more resource into intensive it will be to run that stack. Which is not saying that down the road you'll probably end up using something like Redis or another in-memory store. Uh, and that's fine. Uh, I think that Elixir just gives you like uh, the liberty to start with a very limited set of services and then as, as you scale your team and your application, it's easy enough to add these services and breakout functionality to use it.